Hey guys, it's Sarah. In this video, we're going to be going over NCLEX RN ATI Comprehensive Review. This is part 6E, in which we're going to be talking about cardiovascular disorders. Here are some lab tests that are associated with heart diseases. So first of all, electrolytes. So you're going to be checking the potassium especially. ESR, erythrocyte sedimentary rate. So this tells you there's inflammation in the body, which could be in the heart. Blood coagulation test. So PTT if the patient's on heparin, PT if the patient's on warfarin, and INR. What these do is that they tell you if there's a blood clot. Then we go on to total serum cholesterol. This includes LDL, which is the bad cholesterol, HDL, which is the good cholesterol, and triglycerides. BMP. This stands for brain natriuric peptide. So if this is more than 100, it indicates heart failure. Enzymes. And then tell you about the death of heart muscles. So if there's a heart attack. CKMB is creatinine phosphokinase MB. It increases 4 to 6 hours after heart attack and stays elevated for 24 to 72 hours. Troponin. Troponin is another enzyme. It's a gold standard to diagnose myocardial infarction. It remains elevated for two to three weeks. Myoglobin rises early, so within two hours of a heart attack, and declines early also, seven hours after heart attack. If you want to know more in depth about lab, you go to my description box and you see a video there in which I go into more detail of, of lab values. Here are some more ways to diagnose a cardiovascular disorder. ECG, electrocardiogram. So this is a record of electrical activity. So when someone comes with chest pain, you want to obtain a 12 lead ECG or EKG, it's the same thing, within 10 minutes to see the areas that's damaged. Cardiac catheterization or cardiac cath. So this is a procedure. So what they do is that they put a catheter through the femoral artery into the coronary arteries. They inject the dye to see the blockage and they treat it. If there's something blocking and stuff like that, then they mm -hmm. treat it with an angioplasty or a stent. So an angioplasty is that they put a balloon catheter to press the blockage open so that the blood could flow through. Or a stent is that they leave a mess in place to prevent the blockage from occurring. Before the cardiac cath, you want to get consent. You want to do a shave prep. NPO six hours before, you want to do the baseline pulses, especially the distal ones. You want to assess for allergies, especially because there's a dye. After the cardiac cath, so you want to monitor the blood pressure and pulse, do a neurovascular assessment, you want to monitor for bleeding at the site, apply pressure for 15 minutes, keep the extremities extended for 4-6 to six hours, they're going to be on bed rest, and you want to increase the fluid to get the dye out. Next one is TEE, transesophageal echocardiogram. So this is a tool to visualize the structures and functions of the heart. It's used to diagnose heart failure and murmurs. So pre-op, they should be NPO six hours before, and you want to clarify the medications that they're taking. Post-op, you want to assess for gag reflux, you want to monitor the respiration, like the respiratory effort, and observe oral secretion. Angina. So angina is a type of chest pain that is caused by reduced blood flow to the heart, like ischemia. There's two different types, stable and unstable. So stable occurs with exercise and stress, and is relieved by stress. So as soon as you stop exercising, it's going to stop. Unstable occurs at rest. You didn't move, it still hurts and it increases over time, it gets worse. Risk factors, a family history, older age, hyperlipidemia, so high cholesterol, etc., tobacco use, hypertension, diabetes mellitus, obesity, and physical inactivity. Sign and symptoms, so obviously it's gonna be chest pain discomfort. It can radiate to the arm, neck, shoulder, or back. You're gonna have shortness of breath, dizzy, anxiety, Diagnostic procedures. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to get a 12 beat EKG. You can give them a stress test, a cardiac cath, echocardiogram, cardiac enzymes and biomarkers, etc. to find out what's happening. Interventions. You want to assess the pain. You want to give oxygen, rest, medications like aspirin, nitrates, beta blockers, statins, calcium channel blockers, ACE, etc. You want to educate them. Lifestyle changes. They should decrease their stress avoid excessive activity, they should exercise in moderation, healthy weight, healthy diet, no tobacco, etc. You want to teach them how to use nitroglycerin. I have a video on pharmacology, but I'll just quickly go over nitro in specific. When there's chest pain, you want to take every five minutes up to three doses. If the pain is not relieved by the first dose, you want to call 911 and take the second dose. You want to store the nitroglycerin in a dark, dry spot and replace it every six months. Side effects, hypertension, and a headache. We do not want to take them with erectile dysfunction medication. Myocardial infarction. This is a process in which a heart tissue is destroyed from reduced blood flow and a lack of oxygen. This is known as a heart attack. Risk factors. Atherosclerosis, heart disease, or coronary artery embolism. Signs and symptoms. Severe chest pain, unrelieved by nitro or unrelieved by rest. It could radiate to the jaw, left arm, neck, or back. Vital changes and diaphoresis. You should know. Women diabetic and older adults often report no symptoms. 
diagnostic procedure. Immediately, you're going to do a 12-lead EKG because you want to see SD elevation, which signifies myocardial infarction. You want to get the lab results, especially the CKMB, the troponin, the myoglobin, etc. Interventions. You want to give oxygen, medications like aspirin, analgesics, thrombolytics, vasodilators, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, and antidysrhythmia. You want to monitor the vials, etc. After that's all stable, then you could give stool softeners, you want to tell them to have a low-fat, low-cholesterol diet, cardiac rehab, exercise program. You want to teach them ways to manage your stress, lifestyle changes, and long-term medication like anticoagulants, antihypertension, and antilipidemics. So the heart is a pump. So when the pump doesn't work properly and it's not meeting the oxygen needs of the body, this is heart failure. There are two sides of the heart. There's the right side and the left side. So the left side gets oxygenated blood from the lungs and gives it to the body. Then it goes to the right side and the right side pumps it back to the lungs to get oxygen again. So this is a cycle. If the left side of the heart doesn't work, then first of all the body's not going to be getting enough blood and it's going to be backed up to the lungs because the left side gets it from the lungs. The left sided heart failure, you're going to see all the signs and symptoms of the lungs like dyspnea, orthopnea, cough, crackles, pulmonary congestion, etc. So the right side, as we said, it gets blood from the body and gives it back to the lungs. So if this is not working properly, you're going to have a backup to the body. So you're going to have all those signs and symptoms like edema, weight gain, hepatomalgy, ascites, distended neck veins, etc. So your interventions for both of them. You want to auscultate so your crackles. You want to give oxygen, put them in foul position. You want to restrict fluid because they're retaining fluid because there's a backup and you don't want the heart to pump harder. And you want a low sodium diet. And you want to report a two to three pound weight gain in one day and to give medications for heart failure like diuretics, calcium channel blockers, ACE, ARB, etc. Aortic aneurysm. So this is the bulge in the wall of the aorta. It's usually in the thoracic or abdominal area. So just gonna bulge out. Risk factors for getting this is atherosclerosis, infection, and inflammation. It's mainly atherosclerosis. Signs and symptoms, it's usually asymptomatic, so if they do have it, it's going to be pain. It's going to be diagnosed by a CAT scan, MRI, X-ray, ultrasound. Interventions. So what's usually going to happen, they're going to have surgery. Pre-op, you want the systolic blood pressure to be within 100 to 120 with the medications, and you want to monitor for signs of rupture. You do not want it to rupture. Post-op, you want to monitor the blood pressure and circulation. If there's low blood pressure, it could mean hemorrhage, and if there's high blood pressure, it could mean stress on the arterial line. Some post-op complications could be arterial occlusion, hemorrhage, infection, and renal failure. Hypertension. This is also known as a silent killer because many times there's no symptoms. This is persistent blood pressure over 140 over 90. There are two different types. There's primary, where the cause is unknown, and secondary, where you know the cause, like renal or some medications you're taking, etc. Interventions. So you want to teach them weight control methods, you want to tell them to stop smoking, decrease alcohol and caffeine, to regular exercise, to reduce the stress, and to have a sodium restricted diet. And a DASH diet. A DASH diet means that you should increase your fruits, vegetables, low fat dairy, and limit your saturated fats. You also want to give them medications like diuretics or beta blockers, and you can also give them ACE, ARB, calcium channel blockers, etc. Peripheral vascular disease. These include peripheral artery disease and peripheral venous disease. So with peripheral artery disease, there's not enough blood flow to the body, and peripheral venous disease, there's not enough blood flow returning from the legs to the heart. So one's not enough blood flow to the body, and one's not enough blood flow to the heart. So risk factor. So for peripheral venous disease, it's going to be standing for a long time, sitting for a long time, obesity, pregnancy, and thrombophobitis. So something that's not allowing the heart to get it. So if you're sitting a long time, think about it, you could be obstructing the blood flow, etc. Sign and symptoms. So peripheral artery disease, as we said, is that there's not enough blood flow to the body. So there's going to be intermittent coagulation, skin with hair loss, thickened toenails, necrotic ulcers, and cold extremities. Because the extremities in the body is not getting enough. Peripheral venous disease is going to have signs that the extremities have too much and the heart's not getting enough. So brown discoloration, edema, status ulcers, especially around your ankles, etc. So intervention. So for peripheral artery disease, you want to get blood back to your body. So you want to exercise, stop smoking, you want to reduce your weight, you want to be in dependent position, medication, and surgery.
and peripheral venous disease, you want to get blood back to your heart. You want to elevate your legs. Don't cross your legs. No constrictive clothing or sacks. And put on compression stacking. VTE, venous thromboembolism. So this refers to a blood clot that starts in the vein. So there's two types, a DVT, which is a deep vein thrombosis, and a PE, which is a pulmonary embolism. So causes for all of them is someone who's immobile, surgery, trauma, obesity, over 65 years old, spinal cord injury, coagulation disorders, pregnancy, and oral contraceptive. Sign and symptoms. It's going to be edema of the affected limb, local swelling, bumpy, knotty. It's going to be red, tender, and local induration. Also, you could have the venous ulcers around the ankle and reddened and bluish skin. It's going to be diagnosed through an MRI, CAT scan, or ultrasound. Intervention. So you could give heparin, and then you want to monitor the PTT. You give warfarin, you want to monitor the INR. You give thrombolytics, like out the place. You want to assess for bleeding and thrombocytopenia. You want to elevate the affected extremity and apply warm, moist compress. And you want to monitor for complications of pulmonary embolism. To prevent it, you want to have the opposite of what causes it. So you want to mobilize, you want to do leg exercises, compression stockings, compression devices, and prophylactic subcutaneous heparin. Varicose vein. So these are enlarged and twisted superficial veins, like you could see them generally on the feet and legs. Causes are standing too long, pregnancy, obesity, or hereditary. Intervention. So you don't want them to stand or sit for a long time. Anti-embolism stockings. Tell them not to cross their legs, exercise, healthy weight, ambulate, and elevate. It's kind of like the DVTs. You want to just get the blood circulating. The next one is Berger disease. So this is when the blood vessels become inflamed. They swell and they could become black with blood clots. Causes are, it could be genetic, smoking, tobacco, and men aged 20 to 35 are at risk. Signs and symptoms. Intermittent pain in the feet and hands, and it stops when the activity is stopped. Inflammation along the vein below skin surface. Interventions. You want to stop smoking and avoid cold and constrictive cooling. Raynaud's syndrome. So this is a narrowing of the blood vessel in the finger and toes in response to cold and stress. So basically less blood is flowing to the fingers, etc. Signs and symptoms are coolness, pallor, pain in the extremities, ulcers at the fingertips, and the color will change from white to blue to red. Interventions. You want to avoid the cold. You want to keep the extremities warm. You want to stop smoking and limit caffeine. Cavage. This stands for coronary artery bypass graft. It's a cardiac surgical procedure that is done to bypass the blocked artery and reestablish perfusion. So pre-op, you want to check the vitals, you want to do physical, you want to check the history, and it's a shower with antiseptic solution. And post-op, you want to assess hourly for the first eight hours. You want to assess the neuro, cardiac, respiratory, peripheral vascular, renal, fluid and electrolytes, and pain. Shock. So this is when there's not enough oxygen or nutrients being delivered, so it causes impaired tissue perfusion. Sign and symptoms. So this is going to be sign and symptoms of decreased tissue perfusion, like tachycardia, tachypnea, olgaria, they're going to be cold, moist skin, pallor, the color of ashen, metabolic acidosis, and decreased loss in consciousness. Okay, intervention. So you want to do a modified Schwindelberg position. Do a large born IV line, oxygen, vitals, and rest. There are three different types. Cardiogenic is when the heart can't pump like it should. Treatment is going to be you want to increase the contractility and reduce the afterload. Another type is hypovolemia. So this is when there are not enough circulating blood volume. So treatment is volume replacement. It's kind of like if you think about the cause, that's what you're going to have to treat. So if there's not enough blood volume, you want to replace the volume, etc. Another type is distributive, which is also called circulatory. So this is a vasodilation, which causes the blood to pool in the peripheral vessels. This includes neurogenic, which is usually from a spinal cord injury, or medication, or hypoglycemia. So this sign and symptoms that it's going to be a little different than the regular type of shock is, is that it's going to be warm, not cold, and it's going to have dry skin, not more skin, and it's going to have bradycardia, not tachycardia. And the treatment, you want to treat the cause. So if it's from a spinal cord injury, you want to treat that. If it's from medication, you want to switch medications, etc. Anaphylactic. This is a hypersensitivity reaction which causes hypotension like shock. So treatment, you want to give them epinephrine to reverse the hypotension. The last type is septic. So this is from a systemic infection. So signs and symptoms are also going to be warm, 
dry skin, bounding pulse, and tachypnea. So treatment, you want to give them IV fluids, vasopressors, and antibiotics. So that's it for part 6G. Please stay tuned for the next ATI and Clicks video. Please subscribe and like. Thank you.